I've got a ton of information to give you guys in this intro, so I'm gonna talk really quickly. This is my Tevo Little Monster large format Delta style 3D printer. With all of this humongous printer, I still get the same print volume, about the same as an Ender 3. So why would I want such a large printer? And the answer is speed. There's currently a speed uh, uh, competition going out there for who can print the fastest Benchy with normal print parameters, that being a 0.4 millimeter nozzle and 0.2 millimeter layer height. And I think a Delta printer is holding that record right now, which is no surprise because the Delta printers have the lowest inertial mass. That means the, um, the parts of the printer that has to move around weighs the least. And with a Delta printer, you just have this end effector and these trolleys that kind of go up and down. So there really is the least amount of weight that has to get thrown about. All right, so this printer for me, the goal of it, and the reason I keep tinkering with it, and man, I've been tinkering with it for months and months, and years even. The reason is because I want to make the fastest printer possible. So I've been using all of the tricks. I'm not going to enter in that contest because I'm printing with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle. I think I'm going to stick with a one millimeter nozzle. So just a massive orifice there. And I'm going to be throwing this printer around as quickly as possible. So what you're seeing here is actually the, the current state of the printer uh, after doing a whole bunch of tinkering, trying a bunch of things out uh, in this video. So. One of the things that I did is I tried a Zesty Nimble, and this is the actual stock Zesty Nimble, and it didn't work for me. I was actually skipping the gears, but that's not Zesty's fault. I'm really throwing an extreme use case at it here, really trying to tax this Nimble by pushing, very rapidly pushing uh, filament through that long um, E3D Super Volcano hot end. And so there's a lot of resistance in that Super Volcano hot end. You really do need the strength to force that filament through. I think it's just because of the long melt zone. So all of that friction through the melt zone, you have to squeeze that through. So anyway, I tried taking the Zesty cable here and sticking it to this bit of hardware, which I designed, which mounted up to the E3D, uh, or what is that, the Titan extruder, and uh, had the same sort of, I uh, didn't have the skipping anymore, but now I had sort of wind up problems, springy wind up problems, and uh, yeah, so you'll, we'll get to that, you can cover that in the video if you want the details on that. So, uh, turns out that part cooling is the Achilles heel here, um, and so that's what I'm really gonna have to address when I further, you know, keep going with this project, which I do plan to do. But for the meantime, uh, I learned a whole bunch of interesting stuff trying all these different um, techniques to really speed this printer up. And that's what the rest of this video is about. You may find it boring if you're not into tinkering with 3D printers, but if you really wanna know why a lot of um, things are sort of standard on all of these printer designs, I uh, kind of do challenge a lot of those assumptions and figure out why things are standardized the way that they are because Basically, I did have a lot of things wrong. <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, I was just trying to, uh, to, to push on it, to make it faster, and I suspected they might be wrong, but why not give it a try? See if it can, if it can work out. True to the spirit of my channel, design, prototype, test. You gotta test them. You can't just do it the way that everybody else has been doing it because that's the, the general consensus or the wisdom of the crowd or whatever. You gotta test these things out, and I have now, and I now know why uh, we do things the way that we do them. So stay tuned to this video, and you'll learn why as well. All right, before we dive into this, let's take stock of the current situation. Now, uh, this printer has gone through a number of iterations, most of them right here and also uh, up here in the control board. But um, yeah, this has been the business end where the real changes for this printer have occurred. And you can see I've got this ring, and that is a ring light which I can turn on by flipping a switch. And yeah, it just kind of blows out whatever's underneath it. So you can't see any shadows because the light comes from 360 degrees around the print. And so you really rely on those shadows to be able to tell what's going on. And therefore, I don't, I don't think this is the best solution. And there's another problem with it. That's the fact that it collides with one of the uprights for the printer. And so that limits my bed travel around the uprights. It means I can't get to the full extents, the full edges of the bed. Now this light is from the automotive industry. It's one of these uh, circular LED ring lights. They're meant to go around your headlight uh, on your car. So uh, it was an easy um, you know, upgrade. I just got it from Thingiverse and, and put it on my printer. But um, you know, it's not the best result. So that's gotta go. And this flying extruder adds a lot of weight 
Now, in an attempt to get rid of that, in one of those, uh, those older videos, I, I, I did a DIY cable-driven extruder, which is the cable drive uh, is the way to go, in my opinion, even though I have not actually tested it myself. So this is going to be, I think, in my first foray into uh, the professional Zesty Nimble or uh, what is it, Flex 3 drive um, uh, cable driven extruder. So we're going to use the Zesty Nimble and then I'm going to hope to retain this um, filament run out um, functionality also on this printer. So the new hot end is right here. And then you can see it, there's a Zesty Nimble. Now that's an older version. This is I think a year old. I've had this sitting on the shelf waiting to install for more than a year. But that is installed on top of the um, Duet Smart Effector. And you see that right there? That is an LED. So there's LEDs at all three corners, although they are going to be a bit obscured by the, uh, the, the, the part cooling and whatnot down here. So speaking of part cooling, these black parts, uh, this triangular piece up here, which is what mounts, you know, in, in place of the, 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 the metal, blue metal piece here. We're going to mount those screws into this, this printed part. And anyway, all these printed parts were made out of PLA. This was just my, um, you know, attempt to get it to where it's uh, working. That was, those are my test prints. And I printed up all those same parts here um, out of um, polycarbonate. So the really high temperature resistant plastic that shouldn't deform uh, being so close to the hot end. So this, I think, is gonna go quite well, but there's still some work to do. After I get this mounted, I've got to uh, mount this to the bar here, and I don't wanna just statically mount it. And there are, th there are things on Thingiverse that people have come up with. They're gimbals that allow this thing to sort of flex and move with the print head. So still got some printing to do before I can fully uh, get this printer running. But the, the final thing that I want to do is to get this bed um, up and running to its full potential. Underneath here is an AC heated bed. So that very large 300 millimeter uh, circular bed gets hot lickety split. But um, the print, the glass print surface has, I mean, it's worked. I, I've, I've had no problems with it. I, I put glue stick down on it. I use my putty knife to pop my prints off. It works. But it would just be really nice to have a flexible, detachable bed uh, print surface. So to that end, I've got this uh, Gerolite, and this is just, um, well, this is the same material that they make circuit boards out of, PCBs. So I'm going to cut a circle out of this big piece of Gerolite using uh, this original build tack that came with the printer as my template, and you can see that that perfectly fits uh, on the bed there. But I've also got this um, PEI print surface. So once I get this circle, uh, the circle cut out of this um, material, on one side of it I'll put PEI, and on the other side I'll put build tack, and that will be my, you know, flippable, um, you know, flexible print surface. Now these uh, pieces of hardware here, uh, in fact, here's a little quiz for you guys. Where did you last see these? If you've been watching my, my channel for a long time, you will have seen these before, but, um, yeah, so I'm just going to drill and tap three M3 holes in the blue section of the aluminum, and these little tabs, these little metal tabs, are going to be used to hold that down. So that's the plan. Um, let's just get to work making that happen. While we are watching me do the work in time-lapse mode here, let's talk about some of the satellite issues around this build. First of all, the Teva Little Monster was the original. It might still be for sale, or like they might have done another production run on it, which is just stupid to me, because the Any Cubic Predator is the clear uh, you know, evolution and upgraded version of this printer. Funny that one is a Teva and one is an Any Cubic, but hey, when it comes from China, brand names don't mean anything. China is one giant corporation, and they just have different teams, but Shei Shen, clearly the designer, the lead designer on both of these printers. So uh, clearly one is uh, the next version. And if they come out with another version with this like light blue color and this massive printer size, then you'll know uh, you should get that one instead. So why is the little monster more popular? Just because uh, that other 3D printer channel has a feud and he decided to, uh, to do a version of my builds uh, and, you know, to yeah, silly stuff, but I think that he got a bunch of views on that and that convinced China, hey, look, this is getting a bunch of viewership. We should start making this printer again, which is, it's all just stupid. Anyway, don't build or buy a Delta printer as your first printer. And really, you got to know that you're going to uh, have some serious um, problems with part accuracy on a Delta. The only reason to go with a Delta is speed and just awesome 
sci-fi motion. It looks so cool. I can watch my Delta printers print for hours and hours. I love them, but they uh, they have a place only if you really want to print quickly and part accuracy is not that important to you. So if that's the case, yeah, by all means, do a Delta project. Otherwise, stick with your typical Cartesian style printers. The physical build is complete and it's looking good. Let's talk about it. Starting with the bed. So you can see I've got the, what is it? The build tack basically. Um, this is the, the build tack that came with the printer. You know, years ago when I got the printer, I just have never used it yet. And obviously I could put this one. This is the PEI um, print surface, flexible, just like this one. And I can replace those if one of them fails or if for whatever reason I decide I like one print surface better than the other. And of course I can just remove them for flexing, for taking parts off, and I can also print on the underlying substrate, which is this glass print bed. And this is what I've been using for the entire life of the printer so far. And there is an issue where um, the part cooling fan here can collide at the far edge of the bed. It can collide with the thumb screws. So if I'm printing on the glass, I can just remove the thumb screws and I don't have that issue. So pretty nice little design feature there. Speaking of the print head, here you can see I've got it all assembled the way that I was the way that I had planned. All the uh, the black prints here are all done with polycarbonate in my heated in, uh, chamber printer. So those are very very strong and very heat resistant parts. The 40 millimeter part uh, uh, hot end cooling fan should do an adequate job uh, cooling that. Um, what is it? The uh, the E3D heat sink there. That's that anodized blue one. I'm hoping you guys can see that. Let's change the angle here. There we go. So there's the heat sink that's being cooled. And yeah, these 40 millimeter part cooling fans, I'm hoping will be up to the task. I don't know if they're gonna provide enough airflow to cool that one millimeter thick extrusion coming out of that super volcano. That is just a lot of very hot filament. And so I might need to replace these with the even beefier fans at some point in the future. The Zesty Nimble is mounted the same way you saw it uh, in the, in the mock-up. And what you can see here is the, um, the extruder motor for driving that cable-driven uh, Zesty Nimble. And what happens when you move the print head around is the extruder motor is able to sort of pivot and allow the ideal angle for that, uh, that cable to come out of the motor at. And I didn't want to print up that version that I showed you guys from Thingiverse because it was just a lot, a lot of complications. So that's just the skateboard bearing in there, which is a press fit into the sleeve on this bracket. And on the bracket attached to the frame, it's a press fit post. So uh, just a press fit skateboard bearing should do the trick nicely right there. All right, now what I have to do is basically just wire it up. So we've got this uh, connector right there that pops off and I've got to cut uh, all the ends off of these wires right here and just sort of splice them into this connector so that I can easily connect and disconnect. Now, the neat thing about a Zesty, or I'm sorry, a, um, a Duet Smart Effector is if these were magnetic joints, then this would just be a quick change uh, unit. So I might replace these rods in the future with magnetic joints so that I could have the super volcano for when I want to do very fast prints. I could have a regular volcano for when I want to go with a little bit better quality. And I could have just a regular E3D hot end for when I want to print very slow and very high quality on this printer. And it could be just, you know, quick change, very easy. I don't think there's a way to, uh, to make it so that these are, um, it's a tool changing printer. You're going to have to manually change the print heads yourself, but uh, it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting capability there. Of course, that ability to quick change is lost as soon as you put a zesty nimble on the, on the thing. <laughs> oh well, it is what it is. All right, let's get to the wiring. I'm not gonna show this job on camera, so let's just take a look at the final result. And the wiring job is done. Now I'm gonna go over it, but just not too exhaustively. There's a, a diagram available on the Duet website if you're installing this on your own printer as well. So uh, I have to wire up my, or I have to make the printable geometry for the, um, the filament runout sensor that's gonna use this optical sensor, optical on off switch here. Um, but that's, it's, it's wired up correctly anyway. And on this connector, we've got these two black wires, which are the thermistor. And then these four wires go in the exact same order, you know, positive, skip one, ground, skip one. Uh, and that's the exact same order as the sensor um, plug on your duet board. So those just, you know, connect directly to that single plug there. 
Um, on the other side, we've got this uh, six um, wire connector and that basically takes your two fans. You can see that there's the part cooling fan and the, the main hot end cooling fan as well as the far side here gets the two red, um, what are those? The those are those are what controls the, the the heater, the actual heating element in the uh, in the hot end here. So that's where that goes. And underneath, you can see I've got these two fan plugs here. This is my part cooling fan, and then the black plug here is to the um, the main hot end cooling fan over there. Now it's worth noting that there is a um, back behind this plug there. There's a couple of pins. Oh great, you still can't see them. But anyway, there's two pins back there. And what you're meant to do is if you wire this thing up for a 12 volt fan, in other words, if you feed 12 volts into one of these lines from the control board, then um, your LEDs, you have these LEDs out, the, out here at the edges and they'll get really dim. So if you do have a 12 volt line, you can put a jumper across those two pins and it will uh, double the voltage going to the, um, to the LEDs so that you will get nice, uh, good light. And the rest of it you should be able to figure out uh, from the diagram. All right, well now that this is all wired up, I'm gonna turn on the printer and see how it works. This is what happens when you try to uh, feed filament faster than 300 millimeters per second. So what's happening there is that the uh, stepper motor is trying to spin too quickly and it's just, uh, not able to do it. Stepper, stepper motors have a uh, speed limit, in case you were unaware of that. They can only spin so fast. So at 300 millimeters per second, which is more reasonable, it doesn't have an issue. I've got this silent little fan running here, developed in Germany. Yep, 12 volt fan. And you'd think that it would be moving the same uh, amount of volume of air as the little fan that came stock on the printer. And also, you know, this is the E3D intended cooling solution around their heat sinks. So that's the heat sink and that's meant to just sort of slip on there like so. However, there might be something about the velocity of the air, like the, uh, the air is moving quicker from the smaller fan than it is with the slower, but more silent fan. So I might actually have to install this uh, on here instead of what I've currently got. But I've got one other option and that is this 24 volt uh, 50 or 40 millimeter fan as well. So this is 11 blades. That's also 11 blades. I'm um, hoping that the air velocity with this fan will be higher and maybe it will, uh, you know, cool that heat sink better. And why is this an issue, right? Well, apparently this uh, heater block is just so massive that uh, heat creep is a big problem. Apparently the volume of air that this is pumping isn't sufficient to prevent heat creep from happening and it's jamming up the uh, zesty nimble extruder mechanism here. So yeah, hopefully I can fix it with this, uh, with this new fan. Well, I've got this noisy 24 volt fan running and it doesn't seem to have made any difference. It's still pretty difficult to feed the, uh, the filament through here. Like it's taking, it's like it's stuck in the beginning. And once I get it worked through, it is moving, there we go. Once it gets to a point that it's flowing, it gets a little easier for a minute. There we go, it's a little easier. But as soon as it like, as soon as I hold on to it and don't move it for a minute, it kind of gets stuck again, which makes me think that there is a heat creep issue. And that's kind of unfortunate. I paid a lot of money for this heater block uh, from E3D. So maybe I need to get the new uh, fancy throat design from Slice Engineering to fix E3D's lackluster engineering here. Go with the uh, with the pros there out of Florida. They're making that new copper encased um, hardened stainless steel throat. Pretty neat stuff. So, yeah, I think I might go with that to try to solve this problem. But then, you know, I'd have to wait a couple of days. So I'm going to try to get this to work now. Unfortunately, this this friction in the uh, in the filament path, it's really too much for the the zesty nimble to overcome. And so the zesty nimble. It's making this god awful noise and I'm hoping I'm not doing like irreversible damage to the Zesty Nimble, but here, let me show you guys what I'm talking about.
Well, it's intermittent. It's not as bad as it was, but still, I wonder, I wonder what I'm doing. I wonder how badly I'm damaging the gearing inside the Zesty. I gotta tell you guys, you've never seen uh, ooze like this before. Watch this, I'm gonna milk this, uh, this hot end. And that's what it takes to uh, get the nozzle ready uh, for measuring uh, the bed height with the, uh, with the smart effector. Speaking of which, let's do that right now. Oh look, it's still dribbling. All right, G29. Make sure the bed is cleaned off and send. Pretty cool, huh? Sensorless homing. I mean, technically there's a sensor up in the uh, smart effector, but uh, you don't have an extra like a BL touch or a pin to probe or any of that BS. It's, uh, yeah, it's strain gauge based bed probing. This is the future, uh, something that Duet is leading the way on and Creality is, you know, following in Duet's footsteps with their latest printer. Anyway, that's how it's done. So I think I'm ready for a test print. And unfortunately, I'm just asking too much uh, from the Zesty Nibble here. Uh, let me start this test print and show you guys what I mean. So that's the, uh, the stepper motor, can't keep up. If I spin it, it kind of helps it. It'll pick it up here in a second. There we go. So yeah, if I can help the Zesty, like if I push this through, the grinding goes away a bit. So it just doesn't have the oomph for this, for this to force this through. And the stepper motor can't spin fast enough. Here's the Zesty, I've got it unbolted from the machine. This is the business end of the Zesty. And inside of here is the, um, the gearing. And for those of you who don't know, the Zesty and the Flex 3 drive both work the same. They've got these uh, worm gears inside of them. And you can see when I take this apart that the worm gears uh, are it's grinding. So see all that white powder in there? That's just nylon dust uh, from, from grinding. So that's not good. I have basically uh, ruined the gears by rounding off all the teeth uh, on my Zesty. So hopefully uh, I can still install this in another printer, a more normal use case, and I won't be overtaxing the gears and destroying them. Hopefully it'll still work. Um, but I'm not holding my breath. I think that might be ruined. Bummer. I really wish that I hadn't ruined my Zesty. I paid a pretty penny for this. Um, here's hoping that it's not ruined. At any rate, uh, this isn't going to work. Uh, I've got too many problems. The problem back here with the um, with the stepper motor skipping and the problem with the, uh, the Zesty not being able to have enough power to really push it through there. So I need to come up with another solution and I basically need to figure out um, I think a gear ratio that's not 10 to 1. This is a 10 to 1 gear reduction. I'm thinking 3 to 1 is going to be a whole lot better. Conveniently, the E3D Titan has a 3 to 1 gear reduction on it, and I already had this genuine E3D Titan, uh, which was previously installed on this machine. So now I just have to figure out a way to get the E3D Titan mounted uh, up on top there and being driven by this cable from the Zesty Nimble, because this is a whole lot better than the previous solution I had with that titanium wire. So yeah, um, yeah, we're gonna make something work here. And this geometry here that you're looking at in the background, that's what I've come up with. So um, yeah, taking a closer look at it, we can see I've got this main uh, body portion that's gonna mount to the, um, to the, what is it, the Titan the E3D Titan extruder assembly, the three to one gear reduction box there. And we've got this clamp here, which will mount to the cable housing. We've got the uh, connector piece, the axle connector, which connects the square drive on the end of the cable to the actual axle shaft. And the axle shaft is what will engage the Titan. Um, and then, yeah, we've got a skateboard bearing here at the end of that. So let's take a look at this thing after I've printed it all up and uh, we'll analyze it. I'll show you why I designed it like this. This is the inside of the genuine E3D Titan extruder. And I've criticized this before, but I need to say it again. This whole lever arm assembly is piss poor engineering. They've decided to double up pivot points by having this lever arm pivot on the actual axle shaft. This is the shaft that comes out of your stepper motor, or in this case, coming out of my cable drive. And that's problematic for two reasons. 
first of all, um, that plastic is going to wear out on the metal. Now it's going to wear kind of slowly and this is probably some, you know, high strength plastic, but still, why would you have a constantly rotating pivot point when you can get away with a pivot point that doesn't rotate at all? So you'll have zero wear. So why choose to have wear instead of zero wear? Problem number one. Problem number two is you can see this lever arm is pushing with that spring against the filament here. So we have three points of engagement, point one at the axle, point two at the filament, and point three at the spring. Now this is nicely levered off to the side there, but still that's about a four to one, I would say. So one quarter of the spring forces are now pushing against that axle shaft, which means that the axle shaft has, a, has to be cantilevered, has to be held in cantilever and resist um, the, what is it, the axial, uh, not axial, that's the um, radial forces that are going through it right there. So in order to resist those forces, I've had to add this skateboard bearing. And that sits out there and it's kind of a funky addition that I really didn't need uh, if it was just axial forces or sort of twisting forces going through the axle here. But you can see I've got two bearings here in this, uh, you know, one centimeter chunk of plastic. There's a bearing down there which you can see and there's one down on this side which you cannot see. But I've had to add the skateboard bearing there just to resist the forces, the uh, you know, the radio forces there coming from this stupid design on the E3D, uh, you know, hot end, or I'm sorry, extruder mechanism. So yeah, this is the solution that I've come up with. Let's, uh, let's bolt it on to the printer and do a test print and see if it can uh, perform well. Now, uh, I actually have already identified a potential problem, so we're gonna have to just see um, how well it resists this, but basically I'm still getting um, axle, or I'm sorry, cable wrap, cable spin up. So I'm gonna hold right here with my thumb, I'm gonna hold that so it cannot move, and then you can see I can still flex on this side over here, I'm still flexing that cable, so that cable does wind up like a big spring. And I'm hopeful that it won't be too much of a wind up and I'll actually be able to correct this using pressure advance. The pressure advance feature in RepRap firmware running on the Duet control board should be able to deal with this if it's not too extreme with the, uh, with the amount of springiness and wind up of that whole cable. So let's get this installed, do a test print and see what we're working with. So here's the whole apparatus installed and printing and we see the problem straight away. The gear is not continuously and smoothly feeding filament. It's got these fits and spurts, starts and stops. And the result down here you can see in the print is a Jackson Pollock looking abstract art piece. It's not at all what we want from a 3D printer. Let's turn this into a direct drive then and try feeding at 40 millimeters per second, uh, just for some extrusion. And you can hear the result there. So that stepper motor uh, is skipping. Let's try tightening the knob just to prove that it's not grinding. It is indeed skipping and look, no grinding on the filament. Which means we need to use a larger stepper motor and that's going to lead to issues with collisions between the push rods and the stepper. Not only that, but this mass here, I just don't think that the, uh, the printer uh, is stiff enough, rigid enough to handle this mass cantilevered up here above it. So let's do a test print with this setup and see what happens. Let's take a minute to marvel at print speeds that could have been. This entire test print that you're watching took only 3 minutes and 30 seconds. And yeah, I stopped it halfway because there's big problems. But this is the dream, right? No more waiting 40 hours for a large print to, to complete. You know, we can just wait a matter of like maybe an hour or two. Uh, but it's, it's just not to be. Now there's big problems. Problem number one, as I predicted, is that um, inertial mass of the stepper motor is making that hot. And look at it shake. It's just, it's really inaccurate, really shaking all over the place. But problem number two is more intractable and it has to do with that uh, hot end itself. The extrusion is, is, is problematic. Let's take a look. Ugly as this is, I could not have asked for a better test print. This is super informative and instructional and I love it. So you see the, uh, the shiny moments? There we go. There's a shiny ripple there and then one there and then one there. They're about the width of my pinky fingernail. And that is the ringing or ghosting that's happening because of that heavy stepper motor uh, being a direct drive on this machine. So. Um, that, when you can see the shaking happening, that's going to be the period. And for those of you who are getting ringing that's like a lot closer together, uh, you're just not able to observe the shaking in your printer with your human eye, but that it manifests. So in order to remove that ringing, the first thing we need to do is remove the stepper motor uh, from the end effector. 
And that's what I've done right here. I'm back to my flying extruder setup, which is basically the same stock setup uh, that the machine came with. Uh, I've changed it up a little bit. I've got this string kind of connected. It's like a big loop. And then I've got these lengths of flexible filament. So there's, there's enough stretch there uh, to accommodate uh, any you know, any position change of this printer. Now, the way this functions is as the printhead moves suddenly, you can see the flying extruder kind of shakes for a minute. So it doesn't have to come to an instant stop like the uh, end effector does, but, um, so it's basically dampened. It's got, a, it's got a big giant shock absorber, more or less. And printing with this setup, this is the test print that I ended up with. So here's the one with the direct drive with the rippling, and here's the one with the flying extruder, and we see no more rippling. But we do still see uh, this ugliness up the wall. So what is going on there? Well, it has to do with the, the heat retention of the very thick extrusions, one millimeter thick extrusions. So up here on the wall, basically it's trying to shrink at, in, along the lengthwise. So yeah, there's probably a little shrinkage no, actually, that's not the case, because we're laying it out like this, so we're trying to stretch it, so it's trying to spring back into shape. So it's springing back into shape this way, and it's actually making it fatter in that direction. But as it shrinks this direction and this direction, it rounds over the corners. So the nozzle itself passed over in space exactly where it was supposed to go, and then after the nozzle tried to put the filament where it's supposed to be, it shrank back down. And you can see that because I only have two layers of, um, of infill here, and we get like four or five layers up at the top there where before it really starts to kind of look nasty as far as rounding over the corners goes. But that's not the only uh, problem with the heat being retained and then shrinkage or whatever. There's another uh, issue with that that you can see down here on the base. On the, this is the second layer, right? So let's go back to this one. We can see beautiful first layer, um, you know, really good height up off my bed. Uh, so great layer adhesion. And then the second layer, which should also look just as good, has these gaps in between the different extrusions. And what's going on there is um, the filament has to pass through an orifice. So the, down there, the, the, the hole in the nozzle is now currently one millimeter thick. So the filament is being squeezed through that orifice, and then it's being bent 90 degrees. So we'd be looking at the, at the nozzle from underneath the bed in this instance. And as we're smearing, you know, as we're moving the, uh, the filament, it's getting smeared along and squished flat. So it's not just round anymore, it's getting squished flat. Well, it came out of the nozzle round. And so what's happening here is it's trying to spring back to that round shape. And as soon as it springs back to the round shape, it's no longer uh, making, you know, you know, it's no longer touching. It's no longer making a connection to the extrusion, you know, the previous extrusion next door. And so in order to solve this problem, uh, I basically need to slow down the, the print uh, and, you know, to, to give it time to, for, the, for the nozzle itself to sort of heat up the extrusion next door that is cooled down and also to kind of like give the filament time to sort of like change its shape without trying to spring back into that round shape. So this is the uh, the test print with, with, with it slowed down a lot. So every centimeter here I changed the speed. At the bottom I started out at 16 millimeters per second and you can see it looks quite gorgeous, looks really nice. Um, so by the time I got up here I was at 400 millimeters, or I'm sorry, 40 millimeters per second and then right there, I changed it to 50 millimeters per second. And you can see, we start to get at 50 millimeters per second, we start to get the rounding of the corners pretty severely. Now, theoretically, we're getting rounding here at 40 millimeters per second too, but it's really not observable. So I'm gonna say 40 millimeters is the speed limit for this nozzle as far as uh, cooling for single walls goes. And it's really interesting because once we get up to around there, I think I, I basically start to have, um, uh, what is it, there's infill happening underneath there. And so it, 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 the infill holds the corners where they're supposed to be. So if you had infill for this whole part, you can get away with 50 millimeters per second. But with infill, your, 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 your print speed is not going to be as quick as just with this vase mode. So um, yeah, there's just trade-offs every which way you go uh, with this. Anyway, taking that lesson to heart, the 40 millimeters per second is the, uh, is the speed limit. This is the cube that I've ended up with. And we see, again, we can see where the, where the infill starts. We can see that line, but it's faint. Anyway, we can see a little bit of rounding there where we're still in you know, vase mode. And again, this print, good as it looks, is super instructional as far as um, 
diagnosing uh, artifacts on the surface of the print. So to start off with, we can see this irregular edge, and that is where the um, inside there I have a I have a tower. I actually built a little just like a needle underneath this single dimple because I wanted to support the tip of that dimple, right? So inside there I was getting a um, uh, a retraction move where it was having to move from this outer wall and jump to the inside and every time it did the retraction move and jumped is where you're seeing those those changes so um, here it did the retraction move at the dimple and so we're not seeing the artifacts there but right above the dimple follow that across and we start to see where the retraction move was happening and it's that repriming of the nozzle as it comes back around the repriming makes it less than perfect and you can really see that right here so there was a there was a repriming of the nozzle that had to happen right at the very tip of this dimple inside there and it took until there before we were extruding regularly so we got decent extrusion and then it and then it had like an air bubble or whatever and i still got uh stringing between the wall and the spire inside there and even with stringing so that means i need to increase my um my retraction to eliminate the stringing but even with uh, only one millimeter of retraction, I'm getting this sort of an issue on my print. So yeah, there's just trade-offs every which way you go. And at only 40 millimeters per second, what's the point? If all I can do because of this nozzle at one millimeter you know, wide, 40 millimeters per second is what I'm limited to. So what's the point in printing on a very fast moving Delta machine? I might as well be printing on like a, a CR10 or some other form of a, a, a giant Mendel printer. Those things can handle up to 50 millimeters per second. So I think that this Volcano uh, hot end with a one millimeter nozzle is the technique to use if you want to print quickly on your uh, Mendel style or you know the, the moving bed and the Y axis, that style of frame. This is the this is the nozzle to use. But for this printer, uh, in order to print any quicker than this, uh, I'm gonna have to come up with a different technique. Taking another look at this test print here where it starts to fail at the 50 millimeters per second mark, uh, I'm seeing zero, absolutely not even the slightest hint of ghosting or ringing, which means the printer can move a lot faster. And I know that the hot end can squeeze out filament at a faster rate. So the failure that I'm having is entirely uh, part cooling. That's the failure. So I've had the bright idea to use a blowgun from my air compressor to try and give me increased cooling and I'm gonna run a couple more test prints. All right, so here's the first test print. At every 10 millimeters or one centimeter, I upped the speed, ending up at 100 millimeters per second up here at the top. And darn, if that doesn't look pretty close to every bit as good of quality as I was getting here at like 40 millimeters per second. So uh, yeah, the interesting thing about this is the quality right here on this side, pretty decent, even at 100 millimeters per second. But you go around the back here, that does not look good. That doesn't look good at all. And that's because I was cooling from this edge right here. So that got lots of cooling, and this is on the shadow of the cooling. So don't tell me that part cooling from both sides, in other words, split part cooling, doesn't make a huge difference. It really matters. I don't know why this isn't more widely adopted in the industry, but split, cart, split part cooling really should be seen everywhere. Anyway, yeah, so apparently I just need the extreme levels of part cooling that I'm doing for this, and I'm gonna do another test print right now, uh, going even faster than 100 millimeters per second. <laughs> okay, so that one kind of failed on me. Uh, you can see here is a little tail of, if you look down in there, you can see the failed um, spire. Like I said, there's a little spire that builds from right here up the middle and the idea of that spire is to give a little bit of support for this nipple. This one didn't have the spire and you can see the nipple just is basically not there. Uh, on this one, the nipple is somewhat supported at 100 millimeters per second. But anyway, that spire you can watch in the video was just always breaking off the whole time. And it finally, you know, the, the little oozing 
from uh, jumping from here to there. I'm getting uh, the retraction settings not sufficient, so I'm getting some, some stringing there, and that stringing kind of got caught and pulled to the outside. So there's your first uh, quality control problem. But yeah, I mean, I ended up printing here at 166 millimeters per second. I went up by, uh, so this is, this is what, 6,000? 6, 6,000 is the same speed as um, 100 millimeters per second, 6,000 millimeters per minute. So 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 millimeters per minute or 166 millimeters per second. And then uh, I failed because one of these, you can just see how difficult it is to get um, uh, bridging. Yeah, bridging is a big problem at these speeds with this big filament thick uh, extrusion width. And one of my bridges here caught the nozzle, caused a massive layer skip, and I had to move that, that head, that print head out of the way so I wouldn't, you know, cause any more problems. So, but yeah, look at that. I'm still getting pretty decent. I mean, that's not great, but it, it, it's almost workable even at 10,000 millimeters per minute. So I think most of the problems that I'm seeing here still don't have anything to do with the inertial mass on the print head. I could print even faster for as far as inertial mass and ringing goes, but what I'm seeing is a big problem with uh, pressure advance. Well, I should say, yeah, building up, you know, the pressure in, or in order to push it out, uh, the, the filament out of the orifice of the nozzle there. So, um, yeah, the pressure advance setting in Duet should work wonders to allow me uh, to fix this. So now I'm going to play with the pressure advance settings, and I'm going to try. I'm going to see if I can't get uh, 200 millimeters per second with the 1.0 millimeter nozzle. So where do we go from here? Well, this gets really interesting. I've got this prototype hot end from Slice Engineering. This is like a prototype mosquito hot end just for a, a massive flow. Uh, so this is their competitor to the Super Volcano from E3D, and this thing looks really promising. We'll get into the details of this. Uh, I mean, not that there's a whole lot of people out there that have use for something like this, but if you do, you, you'll be excited to see this. And then, of course, to address that, the big problem that we're having here, I've got this air compressor. So this um, printer is going to have a dedicated air compressor to cool it there. So we're gonna get rid of these cooling fans. So uh, I'm, I'm waiting on some other parts before I can really make all of that happen. So it could be a couple of months. <laughs> that's how I roll, roll, guys. I'm sorry it takes me a long time to do this work, um, but that's how it goes. So yeah, stay tuned at some point in the channel future here, we're going to see this thing printing massive shapes, getting that filament cool really quickly, and it's going to be awesome. So see you then. Thanks for watching. Big thank you to these Patreon supporters of mine. They make the channel possible. Without them, I would have quit making videos. Literally, literally. So that'll do it for this video. Thanks for watching. See you next time.